So I, I firstly want to just ask, and you don't have to put up your hand if you don't want to, but who here enjoys learning about history? Yeah, obviously Sarah does. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of you, that's great. And, and I think you'll find in any crowd, people who are interested in learning about history and some who don't find it that very interesting. And um, maybe it's just how you were raised or how you were taught in school, and maybe you might not have a particular interest in it. And history is such a broad subject, obviously. I'm not interested in every aspect of history, but I'm very interested in, in let's say, Christian history, for example, the history of our faith, the history of where our faith came from and how it adapted and changed over time. And so I, I really think that for our purposes today, we, we want to be able to investigate how Christianity got to the point where we're at right now. And I know that seems like a big task, considering we're going to go from all the way from the fourth century to today, but I think we can do it. And um, so that's what we're going to look at. And I think we should always be viewing ourselves and our lives as being on a journey of discovery. Is that not a good way to think of it? There's no way we can learn everything all at once. Nobody can. And so if we understand ourselves to be on a journey of discovery, that you're, over time you're learning more and more about our faith, about who you are, about your relationship with God and other people, I think that's the best way to think about it because, again, there's no way. There's too much to pursue. There's too much to uncover. But if you are always asking and wondering and, and pursuing the truth about so many different things, I think that's a good approach to take. And so as we look at Christian history, that's what we began to do about a month ago. We started looking at the major events of the beginning of Christian history, so to speak, in the first century. But this is our goal. Our goal is really to discover how Christianity has evolved and adapted over time. And of course, the point I, I've been making is that depending on the circumstances and the experiences that, that each generation was facing, they had to adapt the faith to meet those circumstances, to be able to survive as Christians within those circumstances. Of course, in the first century, in the later half of the first century, it was the horrible war with the Romans and the destruction of Jerusalem, and Christianity had to adapt in order to keep going after that, right? But then in the 200 years or so, two to 300 years after that, Christianity had to figure out how to be a religion within a world that didn't want it. Roman, the Roman Empire wasn't really happy with Christianity, and Judaism wasn't happy with Christianity. And so to be a Christian in the second century, the third century, you really had to find a way to adapt your faith so that you could continue to be a Christian without <laughs> finding yourself being persecuted or even killed, right? Right? But I think one thing that we can see throughout church history, throughout Christian history, is that everybody, no matter who you are, each generation is trying to go back to what Jesus and the apostles were teaching. To, to try to understand what they taught, how they lived, and to, to say that we, our faith derives from them. Right? I think that's, that's always been the case. It certainly was the case in the second century, when in the early second century we had people like Clement, maybe this is the first time you've even heard of these names, people like Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius, these are all individuals who were leaders in the church in the early second century, and they themselves said, we were taught by the apostles, right? We were taught by the apostles. So they were saying our authority, our, our legitimacy comes from the fact that we were taught by the apostles, and we knew people who knew Jesus. And so that's why, if you read the writings of, of these church leaders, there's a certain degree of, of authenticity to them because you can tell, okay, maybe the, you know, they were taught by the apostles and their writings and their teachings is very within, within in line with what Jesus and the apostles taught. And every generation has continued to want to claim that authenticity. And, and, and the way that people did it was by saying that I'm a church leader and the, there's a certain lineage that, follow, that, I'm, that I'm in, that, I, that behind me 
are all the previous leaders of, of the church, and that goes all the way back to the apostles. So this is still what a lot of churches do today. The, the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church says that they are the church of Rome, right? That, that they, their mother church is the church in Rome, and that the Pope is the current bishop of Rome, the current overseer of the church of Rome. But if you go back in time, they can actually have a list <laughs> of all the previous bishops of Rome, and it goes all the way back to Peter. And I think there's a truth to that. I think that they're not wrong in saying that their lineage goes all the way back to Peter because they can prove it. They can show the, the, the individuals who were in charge. And even the Eastern Orthodox Church, so, on the, uh, so the, the Roman Church is the Western Church, and then on the other side of the world, where Antioch or Jerusalem or Alexandria, there in the, West, the Eastern side, you have the Eastern Orthodox Church, and they are also saying that they have th that this authentic lineage of leaders going all the way back to the apostles that their churches were, were formed and, and founded by the apostles themselves. So, so it seems to me, if you want that authentic Christian faith, you should be a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, right? That's, I want to be authentic. I want to be under the authority of Jesus and the apostles. So how come I'm not a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? You know, certainly many people do make that decision to become part of those churches because they want that authenticity, that, that sort of you know, lineage that goes back to the apostles. Well, we have to think of it this way. I grant, I concede, I fully concede that Jesus gave the apostles authority. And that is, they, they had the ability to make decisions, and those decisions had to be followed by everybody who was a Christian. And that comes from uh, Matthew chapter 16, for example, when Jesus said to Peter and to the apostles, he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this language, binding and loosing, was very common in Judaism. It meant making decisions. That is, whatever you prohibit, whatever you say is not allowed, that's binding something, and whatever you loose, that is saying is allowed. So whatever you guys decide, the apostles, that is approved by God. Jesus gave them that authority. I think that is pretty clear. That's a, that's a, a, a reasonable interpretation of, of what Jesus is saying here to the apostles. But does that mean that every generation that can claim some kind of authority from the apostles, they have the ability to change the, the, the core truths of our faith? If they decide to, if they, if, like, if they decide to say that something is true and needs to be followed by everybody in the church, but it's different from what Jesus and the apostles said, you know, to what degree can we say, hey, that's not right? <laughs> you may have the lineage of authority, but what, what you're doing is against what Jesus and the apostles would have wanted. Well, for, for many people, the lineage of authority is what matters. And we actually read in the, at the end of the second century, so we're not that far from the apostles, just over a century you know, separated from the apostles, a man named Irenaeus said, it is necessary to obey those who are presbyters, that is, elders in the church, those who, as we have shown, have succession from the apostles, those who, together with the succession of the, the office of bishop, have received the certain gift of truth, according to the good pleasure of the Father. What he's saying here is, in the second century at least, they were able to show which church leaders had a lineage that went back to the apostles. And what Irenaeus is saying is, you better obey them, because they're getting their authority from the apostles. And the apostles and Jesus, of course, is, are the ones who, who formed our faith, who, who were able to, to tell us what to believe and what not to believe, right? So that meant that if you wanted to be considered, and here's, here's a word for you, if you wanted to be considered orthodox, you had to follow what these church leaders said and did. You had to follow their, their decisions. 
To be orthodox means you're, you're within the, 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 the parameters of their authority, of their decision making. If you were outside of that, you were called what? Do you know the word? A uh, heretic. <laughs> Heresy. So, this is the way that the church was heading, Christian, Christianity was heading, of we have authority, we get it from the apostles, and you have to listen to what we say, and you have to believe what we say, because we have that authority. Now, the cool thing is, is there's plenty of evidence in the second and the third century that plenty of people consider themselves Christians and had wildly different views than the leadership. There, were, there was a multiplicity of views in the second and the third century. How do we know this? Because there are lots of arguments. <laughs> lots of people saying, hey, you're wrong. In fact, Irenaeus' whole book is called Against Heresies. There was lots of people who were saying, hey, that group is wrong, that group is wrong, we're right, they're wrong, right? And so by the time you get to the fourth century, there was a lot of disagreements, there was a lot of arguments among Christians, right? And so what happened was, as we talked about two weeks ago, we talked about how the emperor in the, in the fourth century, his name was Constantine, he became a Christian, and we don't have to debate whether it was genuine or not, the point is he became involved within Christianity, and he decided, hey, we should have a big council, we should invite all the bishops from all around the world uh, all the different Christian churches, invite them to a place called Nicaea, a city called Nicaea, and we should have a big council, and we should decide on certain matters, certain matters that had become hotly debated by that point. And so here are the debates. The main, I don't know if, the, I hope this is clear. These, there was two main debates that occurred at this council in Nicaea in the year 325 in the fourth century. The first one, you have group A and group B. The first debate was between group A, which said that Jesus was a created being who is distinct from God the Father and is subordinate to him. So Jesus is not God. He, is a crea he was created by God, and he is subordinate. He, 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 he is under God. But then you had group B in that debate saying, no, Jesus is of the same substance of God, as God, the Father, and is co-equal and co-eternal with him. So Jesus is something that sort of comes out of God the Father and therefore is the same thing as God the Father. Not the same person, but the same substance. Kind of weird <laughs> to even think of it that way, right? But this was the debate that they had. There was another debate that was not as important, but it was something that they discussed at this council, and that was... Group A said, Christians should celebrate Easter, and when I say Easter, I mean Good Friday and the resurrection. <laughs> and so the group A was saying, we should celebrate Easter based upon the lunar calendar, which is tied to the Jewish calendar, that is Passover time. Group B said, nope, we should separate Easter from the Jewish calendar, and we just should establish a new method of determining the date. Unfortunately, or depending on, I don't want to give my, show my hand yet, but uh, Group A in both debates, uh, both of these debates, Group A lost. Group B won out, and they were declared the winners, and making those views orthodox, and making Group A's views heresy. <laughs> so as a result, it was now heresy to believe that Jesus was created by God, and was subordinate to him. And now it was heresy if you wanted to keep Passover, or rather Easter, celebration of Easter, during Passover. You had to listen to how the, figure out how the church was going to, to date it, and they did do that. They figured out a certain way of dating it to this day, it's still, still kept. Now, here's the thing. The main proponent of group A in the first debate, his name was Arius. And you may have heard the, uh, of Arianism. That, that's, his name got associated with that viewpoint. And so Arius, now, who was there at, for these debates, got, became a heretic because he said, no, I'm not going to change my mind on this. I'm going to continue to think that Jesus is a, created by God 
and a subordinate to him, and therefore he became a heretic after this point. My understanding is that he got excommunicated from the church and didn't have a great life after that, basically, just to sum it up very, very simply. But also, the Nazarenes, that is, the few remaining Christians who were Jewish in the 4th century, despite everything they had gone through, there were still Jewish Christians living in the world, and they themselves didn't believe that Jesus was divine or deity. They, he, they believed that Jesus was created by God, and they kept... Easter time, they celebrated Easter, so to speak, during Passover. They kept all the festivals. They kept the Sabbath. And so they were considered heretics by Orthodox Christians because they also didn't change their minds about these things. They continued to have a different view than the majority, than, the, than, than what was considered Orthodox. Now, here's the thing. So these decisions were made. These people became heretics. And this became the status quo for almost a 1,000 years. Let, let, me, let me sum it up this way. In 380, this orthodox version of Christianity, so the, the, the version of Christianity that was decided upon in these councils, that became the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380. So how many years is that? About 50 years after, uh, 55 years or so after the Council of Nicaea, that version of Christianity became the, the state religion of the Roman Empire. Which is amazing, because just 300 years earlier, they were being wildly persecuted by the Romans, and now it's the state religion. That, that's amazing. But what that means is, now the church had the power of the state to say, not only are you excommunicated from the church for holding these different views, for being a heretic, not only are you excommunicated, meaning you're not welcome among us, now what you're doing, what you're believing in, these heretical views, is illegal. It's illegal. And you could be tried and you could be even executed for having different views. And this is what happened. Most of the time they were imprisoned, but sometimes people were executed for having different views than what the church said was the right ones. In fact, we're jumping here now a few hundred years later, the church began a practice called, uh, which was later called the Inquisition, which was this idea of we're going to send people and try to find people who are heretics. We're not, we're not going to just wait for them to come to us. We're going to go and try to find them and try to bring them to trial. And lots of people were executed as a result. And we add to that the fact that the Bible wasn't available to the common person. The printing press had not yet been invented. And the Bible was only really available in Latin. If you were an, a very educated person, or if you were part of the church leadership, the clergy, well, then you probably were able to read the Bible in Latin or even Hebrew and Greek. But if you were just a common person, and hey, I would consider myself just a common person, you probably weren't able to read the Bible for yourself because you didn't read Latin and you didn't have access to it. So just think about that. You could not have a view that was different from what the church was telling you, and you couldn't even verify those views for yourself because you couldn't even read the Bible for yourself. So again, unless you were really highly educated or were, unless you were ready to give up your life in some cases, you pretty much fell in line, right? Just whatever the church said, I'm going to go along with that. That was how things were for, for almost a thousand years in history. Right? And, and I'm obviously jumping over so much here. Right? There's so much more we could look at, but for the sake of time, we can't do that. But what I want to share with you now is what was coming in the, in the, in the centuries that would follow would, would be called the Reformation. But firstly, I want to look at the forerunners of the Reformation, people who, who, who set it up, who, who sort of paved the way. Because there were, time, there were people in even these, these trying times, there were people who were saying, hey, the Bible should really be translated into languages that people can actually read and understand. <laughs> and so we're talking about here in the fourth, 14th century, so in the 1300s, there was a man named John Wycliffe, Wycliffe, for example. He advocated that the Bible should be translated into more languages, and he criticized the church in other ways as well. 
And there was another person, I don't even know if I can pronounce this, Jan Hus, H-U-S. He also advocated for the Bible to be translated into more languages. And that he advocated for the idea that faith should be something that's personal, something that each individual should come to rather than just being a part of the church. And so I think that these people like that paved the way so that by the time we got to the 15th century, we had a lot of people who were saying, hey, I think things have kind of gone wrong here. We probably should reform some things here, rethink the way we do things as Christians. But guess what? These dissenting voices were usually snuffed out, literally. They were usually executed for having these, these different beliefs, these, these calls for re- reformation. But I thank God for these people because if you're going to have progress, you're going to have to have those brave, courageous, first few individuals who sort of say, hey, this isn't right. <laughs> we, we need to get our act together. We need to rethink some things. And sadly, a lot of them died as a result of those beliefs, but it paved the way for others to come after, and things were slightly easier for them. And that's why when we get to the 15th century, we have officially what is called the Protestant Reformation. Protestant because it was people protesting what the church had become. The church had become institutionalized. It had become something that was, was corrupt in a way. You know, uh, selling indulgences, that is, you, you, could, you could buy your way into having grace. And not only that, there were other views. There, there was just a, 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 an amount of corruption. And so there was a monk, a Catholic monk in 1517 named, oh, but previous to that, I want to mention that in the 15th century, the printing press was invented. That's going to be important. <laughs> A few decades later, in 1517, a monk named Martin Luther, I'm sure we've all heard the name Martin Luther, he publicly protested certain aspects of of church practice and dogma. And we don't have the time to get into exactly that whole whole story, but the, the idea of saying, hey, this isn't right. I think we should rethink things. I think we should get back to what Jesus and the apostles taught and how they lived. That idea became very popular. And because the printing press had been invented, and because people were beginning to translate the Bible into the common languages, and using the printing press to get the Bible out to the common people, and not only the Bible, but their explanations of the Bible, people began to finally start thinking for themselves. Right? And this led to, as I was saying, the the Protestant Reformation, and Luther himself became the head of a new church. And it was called the Lutheran Church because of, him, because of him. And there were other leaders, people like John Calvin, who, were, who was in Switzerland, in Geneva. And so, and, and uh, sorry, excuse me, Martin Luther was in Germany, and John Calvin was in Geneva. And there were other leaders as well. But here's one thing I want to mention. Up until this point, the church, the Catholic Church, was connected with the state, right? It was the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so, again, there there were... (laughs) The boy is making noise back there. Uh, There there was a a degree of power that the church had to enforce their ways, right? And you would think that when Martin Luther and John Calvin and people like this began to do this protest, this reformation that maybe they would say, okay, well, maybe we should have a separation between church and state. But unfortunately, I think, for some of the the political leaders of the day, they saw this as an opportunity to say, hey, we could have our own power. (laughs) We can be in charge now. And so, sadly, the Lutheran Church simply became the state church of that area. And John Calvin's church became the state church of that area of the world, and so on and so forth these Protestant churches were still in bed with the state. They, were still, they still had state power. And that's why even, even after they themselves protested and wanted reformation and brought reformation, anyone else who was a dissenting voice was persecuted now not only by the Catholic Church, but also by the Protestant churches as well. But who were these people who were still dissenting voices even among the Protestants? And that br- finally brings us to the radical 
Reformation. Oh, you know what? Yeah, we'll go back to that slide in a second. But let's just, the radical reformation is this. And, and, and have you ever heard the expression, you can't unring a bell once it's been rung? Right? Here it is. The idea that the church needed reformation had incredible resonance with people. Because the idea that, yeah, maybe we have gone astray. Maybe the church isn't everything that Jesus and the apostles wanted it to be. Maybe some of the beliefs changed over time. Maybe some of the things that we do is not what Jesus and the apostles did. That idea became very popular. I think because it's so obvious to a lot of people that the Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox churches just became so institutionalized and so different than what Jesus and the apostles started that I think it makes sense that we should have Reformation. And so Reformation movements popped up all over the place as a result. And in particular, for our purposes, there was the Anabaptist movement in the 16th century. So later on in the 16th century, there was a movement called the Anabaptist movement. And they advocated for this very, very, you know, crazy doctrine that a person should be baptized not as a baby, but as an adult. <laughs> After they, you know, a person should should come to the, their own decision whether or not they need to be baptized and, and as a result of their confession of faith and their repentance, then get baptized. It sounds so quaint, right? Like, that's, that's so obvious to us. But people back in the 16th century had to say, no, actually, wait, we think we should change this. We think we should go back to, to we, this is what Jesus and the apostles would have wanted. But then there was another big movement in the Radical Reformation, and it was those who said God was not a trinity. A non-Trinitarian movement started, and they were called Unitarians. This is the beginning of Unitarianism as a, as a doctrine in contrast to Trinitarianism. And it started all throughout and spread all throughout Europe, including Italy. In fact, in the sixth, late 16th century, there was an Italian man named Sossini, and he gained popularity, and in particular among the Poland uh, Christians who were part of the Radical Reformation, he taught that not only was the Trinity not true, but Jesus didn't literally pre-exist. He also taught that human beings were not immortal, that we were mortal people, and that that meant that uh, your view of hell, for example, was going to be radically different than what had developed over time. And so all these views, these very different ideas about what the Bible actually teaches started here in the 16th century with these, these amazing people who questioned things and, and stood up for what they believed was true. And at the same time, there were also groups who were saying, hey, maybe we should go back to, to the Jewish roots of our faith. Maybe we should start keeping the Sabbath again. Maybe we should start keeping Passover again. And maybe we should be friendly towards the Jewish people and try to learn from them. And so all kinds of Jewish roots groups started at the same time in the 16th century in Europe. And so things had finally come full circle. You can go back to that slide, Lynn. Things had finally come full circle that the people were able to think for themselves and they were not obligated to follow what was declared at the Council of Nicaea. Remember the two things that were declared at the Council of Nicaea? Jesus is, was not a created being. You have to believe that he's the same substance as God the Father, and we need to disconnect ourselves from the Jewish calendar. Well, those two things now were being popular, became popular again among Christians because you could think for yourself. You didn't have to be told what to think. And so I love the fact that the Radical Reformation continues on to this day because the Europeans came, these Europeans who, who were thinking this way and living this way, they came to the so-called New World, right? And they brought with them these radical views. And in fact, they saw this moving to the New World, moving to North America as, as a way to escape the persecution that, was, that they were under in Europe. And so, of course, it wasn't without controversy still, because there were still lots of lots of Catholics and Protestants who also came to the New World. But finally, in America, you had the freedom to start thinking for yourself, to start living the way you wanted to, to live out your faith the way you wanted to. 
and to do so according to your own understanding of what the Bible taught. So numerous churches began, and we're, we're talking about in the 19th century, so in the 1800s, a bunch of groups began who were holding these unorthodox views. And some of them started calling themselves the Church of God because they said, well, we think we're, we're in continuity with the original church. And then in 1921, some of these churches came together and they formed a conference and was born, thus was born the Church of God General Conference, of which we are a part. And of course, our, our heritage as a church here in Fawn Hill goes back to the 1800s as well, when a preacher came and a man named Peter Bauck heard this different view of God, this different view of, of the gospel, and accepted it and started teaching it to others, and our church started as a result. And so the Radical Ref Reformation continues on to this day and I think is, is more alive than it's ever been because now we have all of these resources at our fingertips to learn about the Bible, to learn about the original uh, context of the Bible, to understand what Jesus and the apostles taught. And yeah, we, we still are called heretics by some people. We're, we're called unorthodox by some people. But you know what? If, if hundreds... And thousands, millions of people could do it before us. I'm okay with being called that today too. Because all we're trying to do is simply say, we're not relying on some tradition telling us what the Bible says. We want God to show us what's in the Bible through reason, through understanding, through logic. These are wonderful things. And I thank God again for the, for the wonderful people who paved the way. The Radical Reformation, the people who were part of that, paved the way forward for us. And of course, if you were to ask any of these people who were part of the Radical Reformation who originally paved the way forward for us, it's Jesus, right? Jesus is the ultimate one who paved the way forward. He did so through the cross. He show, showed that the cross is the way forward, right? If you want to have life, then first you have to give up your life for God, right? And that's why we... We talk about the blood of Jesus. We talk about how Jesus died for us because that is him making the way forward for us so that we too can follow that path of pursuing him, pursuing truth. And so we're going to sing all because of the blood of Jesus to close our service this morning. <laughs> 